Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this Zoom call, this uh, webinar. My name is Reverend Dr. Paul McAllister. I am the chair of the Interfaith Caucus of the North Carolina Democratic Party. I'm also our host for a conversation that we have with men of color and candidates all across the state for the North Carolina Democratic Party called Chop It Up. Today, we are hosting a conversation with Reverend Jennifer Butler, who is the National Director for Faith Engagement for the Harris Waltz Campaign. We also are joined by several distinguished guests who will be panelists. Among them are specifically Dr. Marietta Vandertoll, who is a lecturer or researcher at Oxford, having completed um, or rather Cambridge, having completed an assignment at uh, Oxford University. She's a professor and a scholar, and she'll and we'll share more about who she is. She's a friend of mine, as well as is Jennifer. We also have our North Carolina State Auditor, Jessica Holmes, with us, and she's on the campaign trail, squeezing us into this moment. So we're so happy, uh, Jessica, that you could be with us. We're also joined by Dr. Gracie Galloway, who is the Chair Emeritus of the Asian American uh, Caucus of the North Carolina Democratic Party and a retired healthcare professional. We're joined by Dr. Burhan Ganahim, who is the first Vice Chair of the Arab Caucus, Chair of the Board for Voices for Justice in Palestine, and a retired pharmacology and toxicology researcher at NIH, or the National Institutes of Health. Then we also have Reverend Glenn C. Uh, Glenn C. Redrick, who is a minister, a preacher, a social justice advocate, educator, and broker. And there are many things I can say about Reverend Glency and her activism and her nationwide engagement with the Poor People's Campaign, especially as it pertains to her work with Dr. Barber and others here in North Carolina. I think I've got everybody's name. If I've missed someone, I will correct it. But uh, Kayla, would you put everyone on the screen, all of the panelists, so we can see uh, everyone? Um, and that might involve simply changing my view so that I can see the gallery. That is absolutely the case. So we have Reverend Butler, uh, Marietta, Burhan, Glency, Gracie, and Jessica. And we're happy to see all of you. Um, and we appreciate you taking time for this wonderful conversation. Uh, I will share more as to why each of you has a significant contribution to make in this conversation. But before I do that, allow me to formally introduce Reverend Butler in her new role as uh, Director of Faith Engagement, since many of us may not be familiar with who she is. Reverend Butler has spent the last three decades strengthening and rebuilding the progressive faith movement. She has dedicated her life to helping individuals and communities reclaim scripture and ground themselves in liberative spirituality that empowers them to speak out with a faithful voice to change the world. As a consultant, Christian author and speaker, Reverend Jen exposes the threats of global religious nationalism and offers spiritual practices and religious strategies to counter it. She is the author of two books that I know of, Born Again, The Christian Right Globalized, and Who Stole My Bible. Jen, we're happy that you are here with us and feel free to uh, share with us a little bit more about you, and then we'll get into your presentation. After we get into your presentation, then we'll come back to the others who are here with us. They will share more about themselves, and then we'll have a round robin or panel discussion 
then open everything up to our audience. So Reverend Jen, tell us something about yourself. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you, Paul. Thank you for all the work for justice that you're doing from North Carolina to the rest of the world. Um, and it is uh, an honor to be here with you tonight. Part of uh, what excites me so much about this call is I'm a fellow Southerner. I grew up in Georgia and I've recently moved back to Georgia in part because I wanna help it continue to become a blue state or a state that works uh, for just policies for everyone. And, um, you know, I grew up here um, in the 80s when a lot of white Christians in particular were being aligned behind Ronald Reagan and the Republican Party and I was often uh, taught, you know, that to be a Christian was to vote Republican. But uh, fortunately, I had some good Bible teachers and I read the Bible for myself and I saw this Jesus who wanted to bring good news to the poor and freedom to the oppressed. And I was deeply concerned about racism in my community and about um, the potentiality of nuclear Armageddon. It was the height of the arms race. And I saw in Jimmy Carter, my fellow Georgian, someone who challenged racism, integrated public schools, of which I was one of the first recipients uh, of that effort, and who also worked for peace and justice around the world. By no means a perfect president, no one is, but one of the most moral and ethical presidents, perhaps, that we've ever had. Um, and so that, you know, informed my entire, I think, life. And I've worked to um, help people reclaim faith for justice because our faith has been hijacked here in the United States by Christian nationalists. And, um, you know, I think, you know, it's just been a great joy um, to see religious voices for justice and the common good resurging in recent years and the work of Reverend William Barber and so many others um, and I continue uh, to work on that. Never thought I would become a part of helping a political campaign. I've always been an activist for decades now, uh, both in the U.S. and globally, but I'm now really excited to support this candidate and to find ways of enacting justice from through the lens of a presidential political campaign. So happy to talk about that tonight. So the question that many have asked me is, why is the Interfaith Caucus of the North Carolina Democratic Party even having this conversation. After all, we have not officially endorsed uh, any candidate um, at the national level. And so what is it that we're trying to achieve? And so I, I want to share briefly with you and others um, what the Interfaith Caucus of the North Carolina Democratic Party is, uh, because I think that's a very important thing for all of us to know. Uh, as we know, interfaith has been a movement uh, that has galvanized and inspired people across many different faith traditions to come together in the interest of the common good. Fundamentally, that is what we aim to do. And in this conversation that we're having, uh, that we have, that we're having tonight, pardon me, it is with that goal in mind, not to endorse, but to listen and reflect the values, the concerns, the interest of the entire electorate within the state of North Carolina. And certainly part of our mission is to help um, uh, candidates who are part of the Democratic Party to get elected. That is a goal that we maintain. We're proud of that, we stand behind that. And at the same time, we also recognize that there can be legitimate basis for dissent or disagreement or discussion. So we're happy that you were able to join us tonight and uh, share with us your priorities, your interests, your work and responsibility in support of the Harris Waltz campaign. Very good. So you want me to talk for a little bit about what we're doing and why? Yes, I have absolutely. the floor, huh? Yes, yes. <laughs> wonderful, well, thank you all for that. Um, so as the National Faith Engagement Director for the campaign, my responsibility is to be sure that all faith groups are engaged and connected with what we're doing. Uh, so it involves doing things like what I'm doing tonight, um, but also not only speaking to groups, but also helping people organize. Um, we have a team of folks. We have um, a number of outreach people dedicated to particular constituency groups to Jewish groups, to Muslim, Catholic, African-American. 
And we have a lot of coalitions that have formed that we're helping to support and we're in relationship with. And just to give you a sense of the diversity of religious groups that have um, organized to support this candidate because of her values, we have the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints for Harris, or LDS. Some people know them as Mormons. Um, Evangelicals for Harris, Catholics for Harris, Christians for Harris. We have Interfaith for Harris, and we have Cantors and Rabbis for Harris. And more groups continue to form and become uh, connected to us and in relationship with us. We're sponsoring a number of events, and often those are in partnerships with other um, groups. And I can share the links at the end um, of the evening. We have a vice presidential debate night event coming up on Tuesday at 730. We have an ongoing prayer call in the 40 days before the election. It's an interfaith prayer call. If any of you would like to lead that call, please let me know. But that is happening nightly, and members of the campaign are attending that call because they need prayer. October 3rd is our Souls to the Polls kickoff call. That's Thursday. And we'll have gospel music. Uh, we'll have members of Congress and pastors speaking on that call. We have a newsletter you can sign up for to learn more about these events, and you can also follow us on social media. On Twitter, we're Faith Number 4 Harris, and then on all the other channels, we're Faith for Harris. Harris, as many of you know, is the daughter of a Hindu and a Christian. She was raised in the Black Church. She attends Reverend Amos Brown's church in San Francisco, um, she, which is a Baptist church. Uh, her mother you know, also taught her reverence for Hindu temples. And later she married Doug Imhoff, who is Jewish, creating an interfaith home with her new family and her two stepchildren. And her life story reflects the lived experience, I think, of millions of Americans who are in interfaith households. And she has taken, I've talked to her pastor, Reverend Brown, and she is the kind of person who puts her faith in action, who sees faith as an expression of social justice and compassion and empathy, and it's what drove her into her career as a prosecutor um, and a lawyer seeking justice for the marginalized and the vulnerable. In many ways, I see her ability to be grounded in her faith while embracing and, and, and understanding and being curious about other faiths as an antidote in itself to what we see in America with the rise of Christian nationalism, the effort to impose one particular faith on the populace as opposed to uh, embracing the unique American experiment of pluralism, of religious freedom. Uh, I think the core question of this election is, how do we build a true multi-faith, multi-racial democracy? It's what we've always expressed that we are. It's an expression in our constitution and in our rhetoric, but we can all acknowledge the ways in which our country has fallen short and the core question here is, what direction will we go? Will we continue to strive for that? Or will we close down uh, into something that is no longer a democracy and that no longer embraces the diversity that this country uh, represents? As you all know, this race is very, very close and it will remain close to the very end. So have no doubts about that. If any of us thought maybe at the convention when I came on board as a staff person, which feels like a year ago, but was really only weeks ago, uh, there's not going to be some sort of surge. This country is deeply, deeply divided. We will have to fight to the very end to secure freedom and dignity for all Americans, and it will take everything we have. Harris must win either Georgia, the state I reside in, or North Carolina. So it's great that we're gathering here tonight. She, she has no other path to the White House. She has to get one of these states in addition to others. There are a couple of pathways, but she needs one of these southern states. And the election is uh, in, the, in the states that are the battleground states. Trump is close to 50 percent in all of those states that we need to win. A lot of voters don't know Harris yet. They don't know Walls yet, and our time is very short. We have, what, as of today, 35, 34, it might be a day off. I don't like to look at it, but we don't have much time left. And to win, 
because it's so close, we have to not only mobilize our base, but we have to persuade. Vice President Harris and Governor Walls are fighting for a new way forward in this country that protects our fundamental freedoms, that strengthens our democracy, and ensures every single person has an opportunity not just to get by, but to get ahead. And as a prosecutor, as an attorney general, as a senator, and now as vice president of the United States, Kamala Harris has always stood up for people against scammers, predators, and powerful interests. She's a uniter, and she stands for all Americans, not just people in her party or of her particular beliefs. She has promised to be a president for all Americans who unites us around our highest aspirations and a president that fights for the American people. From the courthouse to the White House, that has been her life's work. From the people I have met on the campaign who are her close advisors, who have worked with her on international issues and foreign policy, who have worked with her on domestic issues, they have expressed that that is who they, she is and this is why she, they work for her. Her, her values, to me, her, her theme of freedom, uh, her, her themes around being a president for all Americans, this love of neighbor, this care for the least of these, for the marginalized, to me, connect with my Christian values and with the values, I think, of all of our faiths. I want to talk a little bit about what is at stake in this election in terms of what we're up against and who we're up against. I think what's at stake is our freedom to live in a free society that is multicultural, multi-faith, and multiracial, a society where everyone flourishes. Trump has a plan in place this time. Last time he was elected, he was caught by surprise. Some have said that he was not running to win or expecting to win. He was caught off guard, but this time they have a playbook. Project 2025, is a 900-page battle plan for ending democracy. I encourage you to Google it. It sits online in broad daylight. I have read it. Okay, I've skimmed it. 900 pages is a lot. <laughs> but I have researched certain topics in depth and read certain sections in detail. It's not just a policy plan, although there's a lot of policy in there. It's a plan to make the president a king. He has a plan to ensure that his power this time will go unchecked. Here are some of the ways that will impact our day-to-day -day lives. I've been, you know, in taxi cabs and, you know, while traveling and get to tell people what I do. And I hear people say, the president of the United States is not that important anyway. Well, they want to do away with the Department of Education. As the proud product of Atlanta Public Schools, I know what that would do to our communities. They want to bring back Muslim bans. They want to deport 10 million immigrants. And that's expressed on Trump's campaign website in addition to in this Project 2025. They want to put the same types of white Christians who justified Jim Crow segregation in the South, they want to put them in power to rule over everyone else. They want to take away women's freedoms, not just with abortion, but access to IVF and birth control and protections against violence. They want to remove all gender equality and LGBTQ equality language from rules and regulations. They want to concentrate wealth in the hands of the top 0.1% in the country. They want to end Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. They want to allow tyrants to hold sway around the world in Ukraine and in the Middle East. They want to end our right to vote and our very right to protest. In other words, they want to end our ability to make the changes we wish to see. So the conclusion I draw from that is that this election is truly about our freedom. It's about whether or not we see the dignity of all people honored, whether or not women are given moral agency to make decisions about their health and their families whether or not there's a pathway to citizenship for millions of immigrants who have contributed to this country, whether or not we have a healthy planet, whether or not we have access to health care, whether or not we can financially get ahead and buy a home. Fundamentally, it's about whether or not our voices can still be heard 
so that we can continue to advance justice for all. It's about whether or not we have a chance to chart a new way forward on the issues that impact our lives and the lives of those we love. This is a turning point in history, not just for Americans, but for the entire world. Trump cavorts with dictators overseas because he wants to be one too, but he also does it because the world aut world's autocrats know that they have to organize in order to kill democracy. They are helping each other win. They're imitating each other's strategies. They're no longer competing over political ideologies. The only ideology they share is that democracy is not good for their power, not good for their business. And they agree that democracy anywhere is a threat to their power. It is so attractive, this idea of democracy, that the idea itself must be discredited and extinguished in order for them to win and to maintain power and control over their populations. So we cannot let them win. As one who works globally, people around the world say to me that they are holding their breath. One said it is unfair that she cannot vote in this election because it will impact her day-to-day -day life in Eastern Europe. They are praying and hoping that Trump will be defeated. And in Harris Walls, I truly believe we have a team that sees our pain. Two people who have fought for the rights of all people, who have led lives of community service and sacrifice. So my call to you today is let's do everything we can to get them elected. And when we do, because we know they're not perfect, we know their heart's in the right place, but when we do get them elected, we build momentum and we organize to make this democracy the democracy we've always wanted to have. I hope you can join me in that tonight, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Reverend Butler. And again, thank you for joining this call. Um, I've enjoyed your synopsis of the situation and, con and concur with everything that you have said. I want to turn at this moment to my good friend, Marietta Vandertoll, who is a, um, who's a researcher and lecturer at Cambridge. And many things that you've said, uh, Jennifer, I believe that Marietta can speak to directly because she's done extensive research into authoritarianism uh, and fascism uh, and totalitarian governments and the impact uh, that they have on democracies worldwide. Marietta, would you tell us more about who you are and the research uh, that you've done and why you're part of this conversation with us tonight? Sure, thank you very much, Paul, and good evening uh, from Montenegro, uh, but good afternoon uh, to, to you all in North Carolina. It is a true honor to be on this call. Um, my first introduction to um, the South was actually uh, through a short visit to North Carolina when I studied at Yale, and now about 10 years ago, time flies. Um, in the meantime, I've studied at Cambridge for my PhD in politics, and I've done a postdoc and a lectureship at Oxford, and I'm returning now to Cambridge for a new research project, which has everything to do with the impact of the far right on the structures of the law across Europe, uh, is looking at transnational uh, relationships between far-right movements in America and Europe, but also its connections with Russia, which are very real and very tangible. Um, I think what I would like to tell you a little bit about tonight is perhaps my experience in Hungary, um, particularly because um, we've heard that Donald Trump refers to Viktor Orban as sort of his friend, as somebody he takes as an example. And I think it's just worth that you know a little bit actually about what goes on in Hungary. But let me start first to say that religion is often conscripted by uh, the far right. It's really useful, it's really flexible. Um, people can give certain topics really the meanings that they wish to give it, like what does the Judeo-Christian tradition mean? Uh, what does Christianity mean? What do traditional values mean? That really um, is not so obvious. What is very uh, clear is that Christians have always been divided around uh, the issues of politics. Um, and some may be more conservative, some may be more progressive. But what is really interesting is that what we now see is that what we call anti-liberalism, as in being sort of not so much for liberal values, gets conflated with illiberalism, which is the tearing down of democracy. And that's not just a, a hollow phrase, it is a practice. And we've seen in Hungary, really, that that takes the form of a new constitution, that takes the form 
of putting advantages to the friends and family members of Viktor Orban. We've also seen that it impacts on the religious freedom of those who do not align to the uh, Orban uh, administration. And this year there has been really quite painfully clear um, with the fate of the Hungarian Evangelical Fellowship, um, whose leader is uh, part of the opposition. Um, the, the church since uh, then has been harassed with sort of fraudulent uh, or um, issues of um, sort of false accusations of fraud. Um, I think one of their financial officers was put into administrative detention without charge. He was eventually released. Uh, we now see that the church is eyeing bankruptcy as a result of consistent fining and disadvantage uh, by the Orban government. Mm -hmm. And all that while uh, actually Fiash, the leader uh, or the party of which uh, Orban is a leader, is professing to be all there for Christians and all there for religious freedom around the world. But there is a real disconnect between what happens domestically and what happens internationally. I think what is interesting is that we have seen this Project 2025 communicated in the open, which is unusual. We've seen that in Hungary, it's taken more than a decade to get where they are now. And where they are now is really a, a space of capture in which churches and institutions of civil society cannot really afford or can really not afford, is maybe the better way to say it, to come down on the wrong side of, of Fidesz and Orban. And what is really uh, striking is how the Project 2025 um, movement, if I can call it, is not just an isolated phenomenon in America. We know that some of the people who have been involved with it um, are part of academic circles in Europe who have been talking about new forms of conservatism that really look more like the radical right than traditional conservatism. Uh, and we've also seen that Judy Vance makes appearances in these circles. And that might be um, through sort of the connections with CPAC, it might be through the connections with national conservatism, or with more um, local lo local um, far-right rallies like I visited uh, in Hungary before. And at one of these rallies, um, I can tell you firsthand, I've heard people speak about racial purity, about the importance that true Hungarians do not mix with people from Northwest Europe because they have now become mixed race because of migration. Um, that was spoken out in the open. Um, and it's really interesting that when you compare the English and the Hungarian rendition of this particular um, conversation, we see that in English, the stuff about race has been very carefully edited out. Um, so this this stuff really matters. And I think what I would like to say is, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether you are conservative or progressive. What really matters is that we do protect democracy, that we do protect the rule of law, that nobody is above the law, no Orban, no Putin, no Trump, no Netanyahu, nobody is above the law. Um, and that's really something that doesn't mean, you know, we don't have to be woke to, to protect democracy. In fact, it is more helpful if all of us um, do protect democracy. And I say that um, from Europe that remembers this month, 80 years since Market Garden, when uh, the Allied forces came to, um, to Europe um, to really help out um, in a dire situation when it wasn't just freedoms that were at stake, but human lives were not spared while um, in that situation. Um, I think many of the Americans remember this as an, a great act of heroism for people in Europe. This is more remembered as a real um, history of occupation with all the pain and messiness that comes with that. Um, and I think I just would like to say that you know, sometimes, um, you know, I've spoken with my grandmother about this. We lived in the war and one of the things that she could never really get over and never really process was not so much that the war happened. It wasn't so much that it was the Nazis who came to the Netherlands. What hurt her the most was that it was Christians who supported the, this regime. And that's something that she's never been able to make sense of. She's always been very angry about it. And she died with sort of that unresolvedness. Um, and I think some of us will not remember really what happened in that war. Some of us got the, Rus the Russo-Ukrainian war to remind us really what is at stake. Um, but I think what is important again in all of this is not so much that we let ourselves be divided over whether we uh, like particular minorities or not, whether we like migrants or not, or whether we like LGBT identities or not. What really matters is that we um, support a vision of democracy that is one with a common life for everyone, uh, regardless of our convictions, because that is what true freedom is founded on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope now that 
um, we've had our first two speakers introduce themselves, we can see why uh, the intersection of their skills, gifts, talents, and personalities, quite frankly, uh, is good for this conversation that we're having in the context of interfaith. And so to expand this further from a faith perspective, we talk, we've already mentioned a lot about Christianity and the conflicts that we have with religious non-pluralism uh, and conservatism. I want to bring on Dr. Burhan Ganahim. Um, as I've already said, originally, uh, Dr. Ganahim was born in occupied Palestine. He graduated from high school in Palestine, received his pharmacy degree from Cairo University and his PhD in environmental pharmacology and toxicology from the University of Texas. Dr. Ganahim joined the National Institutes of Health um, and worked as a research associate or research scientist. Uh, he did that for quite a while before becoming a retired business owner. He is now a community organizer and active in many organizations and emphasis in, with an emphasis on peace and justice at home and abroad. Uh, he is currently the chairman of the board for Voices for Justice in Palestine. And again, the first vice chair of the Arab Caucus of the North Carolina Democratic Party. Dr. Burhan Ganahim, it's good to have you with us. Feel free, sir, to take three to five minutes, introduce yourself and tell us why this conversation is important to you. I, I wanted to thank you, Paul, for inviting me and for this opportunity to speak uh, uh, on, on, on this subject. Uh, I wanted to uh, first uh, say that I don't speak for the Arab caucus of the North Carolina Democratic Party or for Voices for Justice in Palestine. I am here today on, uh, on a personal uh, uh, level. I am um, a Palestinian American with family living under the 75 years of Israeli occupation. Uh, I am a, a community organizer and I consider myself uh, a leader of the Palestinian American Muslim community. Uh, 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 in North Carolina and even uh, uh, national. It really hurts me and uh, to, uh, to say that our community living in pain for the genocide that is happening against the Palestinian people in Palestine at this time, the genocide that is now extending to Lebanon. It hurts me and hurts my community of uh, Muslims, Christians, uh, Arabs uh, in the United States that our tax dollars is going to subsidize this genocide. The Guardian newspaper reported that the number of dead in Gaza since October 7 closed to 300,000 people. No religion justified this genocide. No religion, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, or any other religion justify this genocide. I would even say oh, all these religions oppose the genocide of the Palestinian people. Please, please convey to the Harris campaign that they should not be patronized. They should not patronize the Muslim, Christian, Arabs, and many of our supporters, including Jews and Blacks and other minorities, with empathetic expressions or replicate Biden behavior, we will not be taken for granted. Historically, our community voted for Democrats in large percentages. The Harris campaign committed a huge mistake by sidelining Palestinian Americans at the National Democratic Party convention. They could have grabbed the opportunity to allow a Palestinian-American speaker to speak after the Jewish couple who spoke at the convention. After all, the Jewish couple has demanded ceasefire and exchange of hostages. The Palestinian speakers would have done the same, and Harris would have walked out of that convention of unifying the Jewish and Palestinian and Muslim communities uh, who are Democrats. Biden won Michigan by about 10,000 votes. 
in the last elections. In North Carolina, more than 90,000 people voted uncommitted during the primaries. That is enough to sway the elections in Michigan and North Carolina one way or another. The majority of young Democrats support Palestinian rights at greater percentages, and Harris must uh, know that they may, she may lose some of that vote uh, if the policies of Biden continues to be adopted by Harris. Many more Muslims and arts who support Harris and also open to help her administration with a solution that satisfies the needs of the Palestinian community. If she agreed to end the genocide and the settlements and recognize the right of the Palestinian people to freedom and self-determination, there is nothing on earth that justify anybody to go and steal that land, the farmland of my family who are living in the West Bank, a land farm that my family will all of their lives to make, may maintain, to be taken forcefully from them. Please convey to Vice President Harris that the best way to win the support of a stronger polar plurality of Arabs and Muslims and of our supporters is to be more willing to define what she would do to stop the genocidal war in Lebanon and in Palestine, what define a two-state solution and put American muscle behind that solution. Simply, Vice President Harris needs to declare that she is open to apply the Leahy law against countries that misuse American military aid against civilians and prevent humanitarian aid. I guarantee to you that our community voted historically in great percentages of uh, to Democrats, and I am very concerned as somebody who is a Democrat all of my life, and I voted for Democrats, that this support is sliding away and I do not want to see a Trump taken over. Please, please contact me for any more information. And I thank you for listening. And I hope you will take this message to the people who are in charge in the campaign and for Vice President Harris. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ganahim, for sharing uh, your perspective, which is representative of many in the Muslim and Arab community and Christian community, by the way, and also the Jewish community. Uh, let me share something with this group, because as I read the chat and some wonderful comments are there, um, we are trying to do our best to support the harris Watts campaign. No one on this call wants to see an authoritarian fascist uh, takeover of our government, such as what Dr. Brander told has explained. We do not want to see that. And at the same time, we know we need to galvanize all of our votes in the interest of democracy. And that means responding to some very difficult and challenging issues that have plagued us in the United States. In the Interfaith Caucus, the reason why we're having this call is because we are not afraid to have the conversation. And as a big tent party, we should be able to have the conversation, especially in the context of faith of people who believe in uh, God or a supreme deity or providence and believe in peace and justice and democracy for all. So I don't believe it was necessary to have a representative of every faith tradition, although I wish we could do that. Uh, we certainly do have Jewish Democrats in the Interfaith Caucus. We understand the concerns of the Jewish community and we don't despise any of that. We think it's very important, however, to realize that from the standpoint of this election being so razor thin, it bends and hinges on the votes of those marginalized communities that feel most affected by what is happening in the world. Thus, we've invited the guests that we have, uh, that we've uh, that we have here tonight uh, to share with us. I wanna turn my attention now to Dr. Gracie Galloway, uh, a champion of social justice uh, and democracy in, in her own right, 
Uh, her, her husband, who was no longer with us, uh, is a renowned uh, uh, journalist who was good friends with many in the State Department, uh, Joe Galloway, uh, and her impact uh, across the country has been felt not only in the Asian American community, but in the African American community uh, as well. So Dr. Galloway, would you share with us what uh, API is doing, uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are, are doing with the Harris Waltz campaign and anything else that you feel you want to respond to based on what you've heard so far? Uh, thank you, Paul, so much. And I am so honored to be with this incredible group. And Dr. Ganahan, thank you very much for your comments and your remarks. Um, I just, you know, that hit what you said really hit me uh, right to my heart, um, particularly this, the part about um, your family, uh, your family land now being overrun, because that happened to my family. We we had to, uh, we were chased out of three different countries. <laughs> I mean, I guess, you know, um, one, one of the times was because of uh, the fact that we were landlords and, and then we were chased out because we were Catholics. And then we were chased out again because we were whatever landlords. So we, we've been, we've been, we've suffered. And in that suffering, um, I learned from my grandparents, from my parents, and from my extended family that the suffering is for a reason. You learn from that suffering how to become bigger, better, uh, uh, to fulfill, how you can fulfill your life's mission, if you will. Um, and it also helps mold and form your life's mission. And my mission has always been to leave this world a better place, always to leave this world a better place than what I was born into. And if that means that sometimes you would, you know, put your, your safety on the line, it's okay to do that. In fact, you know, we, my, Joe and I stopped thinking about whether it would harm us physically or not. We, we <laughs> there were so many times that we did things, um, and then later people said to us, "Why did you do that? You could have gotten killed." We never thought about it. <laughs> you know, it, it's because the, the because the goal always was, what can we do as an individual that can help? Hopefully, the next person. Hopefully, our message will get across. Hopefully, our country, um, hopefully, we never were, were conceited or arrogant enough to think that definitely what we would do would impact the whole world. We just wanted to, to influence one person. We just wanted to make one person's life different, one person's life uh, better. So with that in mind, that is how and why I formed the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders of North Carolina. I was asked to do that. Um, and in so doing, I was, you know, when, when I took it over, it, it really was a party of one person. Um, the, the president, the chair before me had such a difficult time. And I, my heart goes out to him, he had such a difficult time forming AAPI, you know, because we are 50 countries. We are 50 countries. We have 20 something religions. We, we have um, a, a gazillion different languages. You know, we are Christian um, with all of the, uh, the inclusive uh, subsects of Christianity, Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, Episcopalian. We are Muslims. We are majority Muslim. Uh, when it, when you when you think about it, because you know Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, and my father is from Indonesia, so he's Indonesian Chinese. So we grew up with Muslims. We have we have um, Asian Jews as well, because you know within the Catholic within the Chinese uh, um, diaspora, you have uh, Chinese Jews, Chinese Muslims as well, and we have Buddhists, of course. And my father being a Buddhist. And my mother being a Catholic, I feel that now I myself just I'm a, I'm a single interfaith community, just, just just myself alone. So 
reaching out and trying really hard to get all of these groups together, get all of the groups to understand that we all share one mission in life. Because if you look at all the Asian countries and if you look at all the Asian upbringing, the traditions, we've always, in every single Asian country, the, 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 what we are taught is do good. Do good. Do good for your neighbor. Do good for your family. Do good for the man across the street, the woman across the street, the child across the street. Even if they are not good to you, do good anyway. So that's what we are taught, really, honestly. And so when, when, when I was allowed and given the privilege of meeting, you know, the elders in all these different groups, that's the message that I came with. And I found to my great and wonderful joys that every last one embraced it. Every last one agreed. Yes, that is what we do. We stay together because our traditions, our beliefs, our life, our loves, um, our shared experiences all follow the same path. And that is to help humanity, to stand up against dictators. Believe me, we ran away from three dictators. To stand up against dictators, to embrace our fellow, our brothers and sisters, regardless of what color skin they have, regardless of what religion they, they practice, because we still are all of us, the family of man. And Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, that group is just quintessentially the family of man, quintessentially, because we are so many different countries. We are so many different religions. We are so many different people. So what Asian American Pacific Islanders understands, what we understand, is exactly what Dr. Dr. Ganahim said, and that is that we want peace in this world. Without any question, we want peace in this world. And we need to get peace, whether it means, you know, he, his, his mentioning of 60,000 people who voted uncommitted, that was, that, that was a that was a wake up call. It was profound and it was a wake up call. But what makes me frightened, what frightens me is this. What frightens me is that while I myself am definitely for a pro states, um, a two state solution, no question, absolutely no question. If Israel is allowed, is, if Israel can exist, so can Palestine. It's no question, no argument. Got to be a two-state solution. While I am for that, and while I support my Muslim brothers and sisters, Lord have mercy. When Trump came into office, remember the first month or two, he imposed that Muslim ban. Remember that Muslim ban? And we all went to the Dagam airports, you know. I learned how to wear a hijab. I learned how to wear one, and I went to the dang airport wearing a hijab, even though I'm not Muslim. But I felt I had to do something to stand with my brothers and sisters. I had to do something to show that I support, you know, regardless of what I, I support. I feel truly that our best, our best bet at getting a two-state solution, our best bet at eliminating this Islamophobia that has just been growing and growing and growing is truly to get behind the Harris Waltz team. I don't want to sound so damn political, but it is political. I cannot for, for a second imagine having Donald Trump in the White House, not for one second, because I know the first thing that he will do is he will call Bibi Netanyahu because the two of them are good friends and he will unleash Bibi, go for it. We can't have that. He will unleash Putin. We can't have that. So he will unleash Kim Jong-un. We cannot have that. And Orban. We just cannot have that. We've got to take a good look at what we are doing and understand that what we are going to do and what we will do will impact not just us, but our children. Vote for your children. Vote for your grandchildren. Think about what your vote is going to mean for your children, for your grandchildren down the line. Think about that.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Galloway. Very well said. And I don't need to add anything to that because I think it speaks volumes. I do like the phrase, I wrote it down and highlighted in yellow. I've got my yellow highlighter up, Marietta, and my pink highlighter right here, highlighting key phrases that I'm hearing. And uh, what I highlighted is quintessentially the family of man. That is what the Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community is. Uh, 50 countries, 20 religions, and as you said, uh, Gracie, Dr. Galloway, a gazillion languages. I believe I got that right. I believe that's the word that you use, gazillion. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I want to turn uh, now to my African-American sisters. First of all, we'll start with, um, I want to hold off on state auditor Jessica Holmes. I know she's been waiting for a while, but I want to hold you uh, last, if you don't mind. I want to turn to Reverend Glenn C. Redrick. Glenn C., are you here? There she is. My brilliant sister, uh, uh, soon to be Dr. Glenn C. Redrick, and uh, active in so many arenas of social justice. It's amazing the work that you do uh, in Charlotte and around the country. So proud of you. Uh, you've got a beautiful photo. I hope you can get to that and explain that. Uh, but tell us how you are hearing this conversation tonight and how it intersects with the African-American experience. And if you don't mind even sharing from the LGBTQ perspective, uh, since I think you do some work with those uh, in that particular marginalized arena, uh, share with us how you perceive this conversation and what uh, the and what the Harris Waltz campaign uh, inspires you to do uh, as a minister, as an American citizen, please. Well, first of all, um, Paul, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity to be with um, such uh, brilliant folks. Um, my heart right now is pounding um, as I listen to Gracie uh, Galloway, Dr. Gracie Galloway, and um, Biron. And I, my heart is pounding because we have so much in common. And what we all have in common is the understanding that in order for us to survive as human beings in the society, we must um, have a collectiveness of mindset that we have to find a way to live together, being able to embrace our faith traditions, understanding that there is a cord amongst all of our faith traditions, and that is how we treat one another, how we care for humanity. So with that being said, um, just to be able to speak on the issues of what is happening to um, what can Im be impacted negatively as a result of a 45 getting it uh, returning to the White House under the initiative of the Project 2025. It is not um, for any of the well being of anyone who is uh, in this space here tonight. We are all negatively impacted um, by this 900 page doctrine by so many um, leaders who whose aim is to centralize power for themselves. So all of the things that are listed in Project 2025 will hurt every last one of us. Um, I am reminded of uh, numerous, um, and I probably pronounced his name wrong, uh, his message about how uh, persons were seeking assistance. I'm just going to give you the short, the snapshot. They were seeking assistance. And what did everyone say that the individual went to? Really, it's it's not affecting me. And so as he continued to display that understanding, at the end of the day, if we continue to pass, it has nothing to do with me. When it does have something to do with you, we will be standing alone. So the larger understanding for us tonight is to galvanize around a candidate who um, may not be perfect, may not be checking all the boxes, 
but definitely has a moral compass that we do not see in the candidate who's running against her. And so uh, when we talk about Christianity and we talk about politics, we have to talk about the fact that um, Jesus, one, did not call himself Christian. Two, Jesus was very much a radical. Um, He was killed. He was murdered, a sanctioned murder, because he fought to make a change um, as it related to poverty, as it related to equality. And while Jesus had to, um, I'm going to say this, had to have um, a meeting of the minds as to how the value of women existed, um, at the end of the day, if we understand the real cause uh, cause of Jesus and Jesus' fight, Jesus, one, uh, did not name Christianity. That was Paul. Jesus was the way. And his way was about justice and fairness um, and equality. And so he died a death that uh, we like to skip to the celebration of that without recognizing um, the challenges and the risk that he took to uh, want to stabilize a country. So we're right here now today, um, those of us who still uh, misunderstand uh, the purpose of our being. So it's difficult for me to call myself a Christian when we look at how Christian is steeped in um, enslavement, how Christianity is steep in capitalism, how Christianity is steeped in uh, pro-life, but really pro-birth, because after life gets here, you're not interested in assisting any of that. So yes, um, this conversation is greatly needed and how we can come together to sit at the table to look at how we have more in common than we think we do um, as we approach this election. I spent um, a few hours just digging deep into this because again, I have another presentation to do and it really is troubling to think what the United States and the world would look like if we decided because one person didn't speak perfectly or specifically or 100% to one issue, we have to clearly understand that we're not voting Democrat or Republican. We are voting to save democracy and we are voting for um, a moral compass to be returned to uh, the society. And I know that I kind of skipped all around the issues, but um, I listed them. Uh, We're talking about health care. We're talking about education. We're talking about climate change. We're talking about the unhoused. And all of that, when you go back and study um, the Project 2025, none of that is in there for any of us. And it wasn't only the Muslims who were banned. There were uh, Africans who were also banned to uh, be able to get into the United States um, as well. So uh, the broad, it's a broad brush. And uh, what Project 2025 is doing is giving us a snippet of what uh, their intentions are. But if you go and look at the masterminds behind um, this movement, uh, which will destroy all of humanity, it says to me, get out and vote and let us be accountable for the things that we want to see change but put our support behind someone who recognizes that it is our democracy that's on the line. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Glency. And I believe that quote is from Martin uh, Niemuller that you were yes. talking about. Uh, first, they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. And I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me. And there was no one left to speak for me. That is precisely why we're having this conversation. This conversation tonight serves the purpose of bringing us together into a conversation, a dialogue that must extend beyond this moment, but be replicated in settings uh, such as this all around the country. And if we commit to that, uh, then we can do some enormous things through the Harris Waltz campaign 
uh, because our voices will be heard appropriately. Uh, and I have great sensitivity, by the way, uh, for what Dr. Ganahim has said and for how he has expressed himself. I believe that that is one of the weaker links that we have right now uh, in the United States and even the, in the Democratic Party. Now, I'm not bashful about saying that. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'll continue to say it. It is something that needs desperately to be amended and amended forthwith. If anybody's offended by that, then I'm sorry, but I love you too. Uh, but we want a justice and a democracy that is fair and egalitarian and treats all people with the dignity and worth and value uh, that their created agency deserves. That's not hating, that's loving everybody. And that being said, someone who represents that in esteemed proportion to me is, um, is on the ballot here in North Carolina as uh, she's serving currently as our North Carolina State Auditor. I don't mean to pull you into the, into the politics of all of this, which is the reason why I wanted you to speak last, because I didn't want to tie you up into any of the, um, any of the more controversial aspects of our conversation. You have a very difficult race ahead of you. Uh, we're glad the governor has appointed you. Jessica Holmes is the first African-American woman to serve on the Council of State in North Carolina. That is progress. We can all cheer for that. That is progress. Um, and Ms. Jessica Holmes, you don't have to speak to any of the things that we've already talked about unless you want to, unless you feel it serves your interest um, as a candidate for the office that you currently hold. But I do want you to speak to uh, the values that we share in common here in North Carolina and those issues that you feel can help us become better citizens and better collaborators in the interest of justice. Ms. Jessica Holmes. Um, it is so wonderful to be with you all this evening. And quite frankly, as an elected official, um, I, I think it's important to weigh in on issues that, that matter. Um, and I'll start with uh, this Bible verse, um, Proverbs 3.27 and 20, um, 3.27, um, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is within your power to act. And so what I will respond uh, to the conversation is that I do not believe that women and children and seniors, I, I do not believe humans, um, that it's appropriate for humans to be collateral damage under any circumstance. Um, and, you know, I rebuke ter terrorism. I rebuke the, the murder of innocent people on every side, um, whether that's in North Carolina, whether that's in the United States, um, in any other place. Um, and so I, the God that I serve um, uh, unilaterally um, does not and would not um, condone um, the killing of innocent people. Um, so that's my two cents there. Um, and so I'll follow up on something that uh, Reverend Butler and uh, Reverend Redrick mentioned. And that is the fact that we as a country, I would say, we better vote like it's our last opportunity to do so because it actually might be. Um, as was mentioned, we have a candidate um, who is besties with Putin and is thinking about his political allies and his political friendships uh, more so than he's thinking about our best interests. And so according to the history books, I'm, I'm a bit of a history buff, but we as a country put a whole lot of tea in the Boston Harbor because we did not want to be ruled by kings and dictators. And I'm not aware of that changing. 
um, or that perspective changing. Uh, we don't believe there should be taxation without representation. And so if we think our, our states have been gerrymandered now, um, imagine us being in a situation where someone maintains the White House by using the military force. And imagine um, us not having the right to vote. Um, you know, we're, we're talking things like voter ID in North Carolina and other, you know, access to the ballot issues. However, there is a very real possibility that this could be our last election as a country. And so, you know, I know I, I personally get tired of the, you know, lesser of two evils argument. However, in this particular case, I don't think that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a qualified, sane candidate versus someone who is not qualified and who is insane. And I don't see this election being about the lesser of two evils. We have competence and we have someone who is not competent. And so the difference between the two candidates is so stark that, you know, when I hear people say things like, I'm not going to vote um, because of this, that, or the third, um, one of my arguments to them is, this might be your last vote. So keep that in mind. And so, you know, the God that I serve, um, mm -hmm. you know, you know, I, I think about the fact that we are reliving so many of the issues that we thought were done after the civil rights movement, um, our ability to vote. Um, let's keep in mind that like women were not able to vote um, up until um, uh, I think 1920. And even then women of color were still not able to vote. And so when I hear people talk about DEI candidates, um, as I have been referred to um, in North Carolina, um, from inside my party and outside of my party, yeah. the reality is we as women and women of color oftentimes have to be twice as good. And in the case of Madam Vice President, she is twice threefold better than the alternative. She is not a default candidate. And when I hear people talk about things like DEI, my response is definitely earned it. She has definitely earned and is qualified for the seat that she will occupy um, after November 5th. And also, um, in that applying to, to me, um, I am, you know, twice as good at my opponent. However, many of my conversations with the media are about not why I'm at the table, but whether I belong at the table at all, hmm. uh, which is not a question that is asked of most candidates. And so I am all in for Madam Vice President, who also, um, like Reverend Redrick and myself, a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. That said, um, that is not why I'm voting for her. I'm not voting for her because she is my soror. I'm not voting for her because she's Black. I'm not voting for her because she's a woman. I am voting for her because she is undoubtedly and unequivocally the best candidate in this race, real talk. Um, we have a president, former president, uh, if you remember the debate, you know, I, I'm gonna do that same pause and say that <laughs> former president <laughs> is when we talk about love and peace, um, goes around bragging about the fact that he killed Roe versus Wade. As a woman of color, 
I am more likely to die giving birth than any other demographic. Black babies are more likely to die in their first life, first year of infancy. There are documented cases, regardless of how you feel about being, you know, pro-life or pro-choice, there have already been women documented as having died because Roe versus Wade was overturned. And women will continue to die as long as Roe versus Wade is overturned. And so we so often say, oh, he doesn't mean it. He's just speaking figuratively. Well, in this case, when he says that he killed Roe versus Wade, he's actually killing people. There is blood on his hands. And that hmm. is a world that we don't want to live in. Um, that is a world that is scary for me um, to be in a world where a sitting president calls for an insurrection because he wants to maintain power that badly. Um, when all of the evidence disputes that there was widespread voter fraud in North Carolina or any other state in the entire United States. And so, you know, I, you know, sometimes when people tell you who they are, you should believe them. When he says he's proud of killing Roe versus Wade, to remix that sentence, he's saying, I am proud that I am denying women who may literally lose their lives if they don't get the health care that they need. You know, we've got a gubernatorial candidate in North Carolina who says things like, sometimes some people need killing. Hmm. And yet in both of those races, uh, particularly the race for president is so close in North Carolina, it's a dead heat. Shame on us. Okay. Shame on us. Hmm. And so if you want, in my opinion, I, I grew up Southern Baptist, and I know I'm going to close in a second, because I know we can sometimes be long winded. But please vote like our lives depend on it. Because in my case, it could. Mm -hmm. mm. So thank you all for being here. And thank you all for giving me the opportunity to share and to weigh in. Um, when it comes to being a trailblazer or the first one at the table, I will tell anybody that I describe trailblazers as people who trail their path literally in tears. It is never fun. Um, to be the first. I'm the first woman of color to ever sit on North Carolina's Council of State and am attacked on a daily basis in spite of my credentials. Madam Vice President is attacked on a daily basis in spite of her credentials. So knowing what I know about how hard it is to have people create AI and memes and attack you on a daily basis, we've got to do a better job of lifting up our trailblazers. Mm -hmm. Even more than that, we've got to continue to lift up candidates that are actually qualified and who actually care if we live or die. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you all. And again, thank you, uh, Reverend McAllister for the invitation. It's been an honor to be on the same Zoom as Reverend Butler, as Gracie Galloway, mm. as just some of my personal heroes. And so I appreciate everyone who's willing to speak truth to power and know that I am 10 toes down um, behind my soror and our next president. 
Wow. Um, this is so rich. And I'm looking at the time and uh, I could have listened to each of you speak another five, 10 minutes and not even thought about the time. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation so far. We have roughly 15 minutes to go. So I'm thinking, what's the best way to handle this? I want to uh, come back to Reverend Butler um, first and allow you to respond to everything you've heard. I definitely want to come back to Dr. Van der Tol because I think your research and your scholarship into uh, authoritarian regimes and, and everything that you've heard tonight, I think you've got a little bit more you can add uh, to what you've already said and even reiterate some of those finer points that you've made. Uh, then I want to come to the audience and allow one or two questions to come from the audience. Maybe uh, you can put your questions in the chat and we'll try to get to them tonight. If we can't, we'll respond to you in a different forum. But first of all, uh, uh, Reverend Butler, would you respond to what you've heard from everyone tonight? And by the way, I must say, um, uh, Jessica, Holmes, and all of you, every one of you is on this call tonight because I personally consider you to be a trailblazer for me. Uh, so I look at you as, as heroic uh, and ambassadors of what is good and right uh, and just in the work that you do. I learn from you. Uh, you're my teachers, you're my mentors, and I'm thankful for you. So Reverend Butler, please. I mean, so much has been said and so much greatness. I love how the diversity of speakers that you've pulled together, the different angles and different communities that we come from. Uh, what strikes me tonight is our interconnectedness, that what harms one of us harms all of us. What brings peace to one of us brings peace to all of us. And the sense of urgency of now. Uh, and I think our last speaker, uh, and congratulations to you and your leadership role, I think it just said it so powerfully. Um, this is about whether we live or die for many of us, some of us more than others, but for all of us, this is a matter of life and death, um, this election. And um, we have a moral responsibility to really organize and step up in this moment and then to continue to organize. One election will not do it, and one candidate alone cannot do it. President Obama used to tell us when we complained about his policies and that he hadn't gone far enough, he used to say, it's your job to get out there and organize and create the climate in which I can do these things. So I am excited to see the momentum in many of our communities. We still have a long ways to go. I've listened very carefully to the concerns on this call, and whenever I have community meetings, I definitely bring all of it back. Um, so thank you and continue to push. Um, and it's you know been really interesting as well to see the global connections. Mm. Again, we are all interconnected. To hear Gracie talk about her experience of fleeing dictators, to hear Marietta speaking firsthand from her research of what is happening around the world. This is about all of us. It's about our planet and it's about um, the future really of humanity. So we have our work cut out for us and uh, we cannot rest until justice is won. So thank you. Marietta, please. Thank you uh, very much once again. I've been listening to many of your stories, um, feeling quite touched by many of the stories. And I think one of the things that we can never forget is that in every moment um, that we make decisions, we have an opportunity to make an ethical decision. Um, some of the works of um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer have helped us make sense of some of these questions um, in a post-war era here in Europe. Not that that brings her to fit all answers to all the questions that we have, but we have a calling to make an ethical discernment. And whatever that is in each one of your situation, that is up to you and your consciences, obviously. Um, I have only been able to share something from the experience here in Europe of when we see things like Project 2025 in a different form, like in Hungary, it might just happen. Uh, like we've seen in Ukraine, that there was a buildup of troops for months and everyone was still saying, oh, but it's not really going to happen, is it? It did happen. And it is still tearing apart uh, the lives of very real people, many of whom share faith with you. Um, I've heard stories of 
um, Ukrainian pastors being tortured um, when uh, captured in the occupied territories of Ukraine. I think some of these issues might seem so very far from us, um, maybe further even in America than, than here uh, in Europe where I work. Um, but I think what has helped us in the last decades is really that when people stick together, they can make big things happen. And um, maybe that's something that's in politics isn't really what characterizes us. Um, many of us um, have gone so used to the divides. Um, in some ways, it makes it comfortable because we don't really have to work hard to understand people who think differently from us. But actually, what is important is that despite the differences, we do um, really foster the, the resources that we have to come together um, in different times in history, but every time in history is one um, and every time matters. Thank you very much. And Marianne, what are the titles of the books that you've written or contributed to um, as an editor? I didn't I didn't share those. Would you share those with us? Yes, absolutely. So uh, I shared one of the titles uh, already in the chat. So I've got one book forthcoming, which is called Constitutional Intolerance, The Fashioning of the Other in Europe's Constitutional Repertoires. And in that book, uh, I look at the impact of right wing movements on the development of constitutional law, and especially on uh, the phenomenon of intolerance as um, expressed through constitutional law in Europe, We're looking at the Netherlands, France, as examples of liberal leaning democracies, and Poland and Hungary as examples of of illiberal leaning democracies to say really uh, what is at stake is what happens constitutionally uh, and not just which minority you like or dislike. Um, then there is the book The Christian Rights uh, in Europe, which was edited by Jonathan Nomuscolo. Um, I contributed with that with a chapter on the Netherlands, which is my home country. Um, and that book brought out, I think for many people, quite how connected the transnational movement is across several countries, how connected activism is, how connected the ideas are. Um, and in a way, it, it can open our eyes for um, sort of the things that we don't see when we, you know, pay attention to the news maybe around us in our country and we don't really pay attention to what happens elsewhere this book really opens um opens that up another book that should come out in the next half year um is on the many faces of christianism and it is comparing the ideology of the russian world as we've seen it come out of the russian orthodox church uh, and of the kremlin um, with radical right rhetoric uh, and practices in um, europe and to some extent uh, also in america so my paper in that uh, as the volume is uh, comparing uh, the idea of the Russian world, um, what Viktor Orban calls um, the Hungarian world, uh, half a year after the invasion of Ukraine, um, but also the MAGA campaign and what these different uh, spaces have in common, even though they are, of course, um, individual uh, cases. So those books are uh, coming out. If you Google my name in Google Scholar, you will find lots of articles that have to do with theology and religion. Some of you might be interested in um, Old Testament imaginaries of the nation, where we critique covenantal sort of language uh, in the far right. Others might be uh, interested in uh, papers that have more to do with, with history and sort of the claim to history. You'll find all sorts of things um, uh, I'm not assuming that you will, of course, read any of it, um, but you might get a flavor of uh, what my work is about. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. And I think if you read those or consider those, along with the books that our special guest, uh, Reverend Butler, has written on the Christian right and Who Stole My Bible, I think you'll see that a lot of what they have to say intersects uh, one from an American perspective and one from a European uh, Eastern European, Western European perspective, uh, and some of the same ideas uh, seem to trickle um, and influence uh, all of our governments that we are talking about tonight. So this is um, this is uh, very apropos to have both of you uh, sharing. Uh, let's go to the audience and take a few questions if we can. I know we're getting late on our time. Um, do we have any questions? Kayla, you're going to have to assist me um, because I'm not sure. I think I'm I'm going to read something in the chat by Ernest or Imad K. I'm not sure who that is, but it says to host and panelist um, for Reverend Butler. Um, you classified that Harris stands for faith as social action for justice. This has not been her position when it comes to the Palestinians. Also, that she will be president for all which. We heard before uh, for Biden, and he ended up 
Um, uh, okay, I, I, I think the gist of this is how is, in your view, and perhaps you can't answer this, but some of these questions you'll just simply have to echo to the campaign. The question seems to be, how is um, candidate Harris different from President Biden in terms of his policy, uh, in terms of his approach to resolving the crises that we see in Israel-Palestine? You can't speak for the campaign, but if you have any insight about that, feel free to share it with us or just share your own perspective if you want to do that. Yeah. Well, she she is not president yet. She would be president, hopefully, in 35 days, 36 days. She you know, has said that she wants to work to end the war and be sure Israel is secure and to be sure that the Palestinian people can realize their rights to dignity, freedom and self-determination. Um, Engage Action, which is one of the largest Muslim voter engagement groups, just endorsed her. And they endorsed her in part because of her domestic policies and also because they stated that she, they are hopeful that she will continue to align uh, with them on uh, their approach to the Middle East. And so I think what we have in Harris is someone who has always fought for the underdog, someone who has fought for, the, for justice for all people. Um, and so, um, you know, I think there is hope there, I think is what I would say. There is hope um, that uh, she would lead in such a way as to bring peace and justice to both Israel and to Palestine. And so um, I encourage us to look toward that hope. I think, I think Dr. Vandertol, you want to respond to that question as well? Uh, well, yes, maybe perhaps from a different perspective than from what uh, perhaps the campaign might be saying, because, of course, I'm I'm an academic. Um, yeah. I teach international relations, or I used to teach international relations uh, before I came to Cambridge. And what I told my students is when you look at the map of the world and you think of all the different conflicts that you see, what I want you to do is to not think about each conflict um, as a way of like, what do you think of each of the conflict? But what I want you to do is to see how one conflict can inform the other and how sort of the issues in international relations travel from one zone, from, from one country to another, and how the world powers are implied in that. That might be America, that might be China, that might be Russia. In the case of Russia, that's also... a change of world order um, in which America is no longer obviously first, is not obviously the one who can sort out uh, every trouble in the world. That's a painful reality. I think what is interesting is that both the Russian and Iranian governments are invested in the division, which makes America even less powerful. Um, and in some of the rhetoric that comes out of both of these spaces, again, we hear a strong anti-American, um, again, uh, slant. Now, that's not to say we should therefore not pay attention to conflicts that happen around the world, but so many of the peoples that um, are so easily forgotten or sort of sidelined, and I think um, there's many who feel like that uh, also in this conversation, is that many of them are victims of this sort of changing chess game in, in world politics. And maybe one of the things that can help us is to recognize um, the chess games that are being played, um, to mourn with those who are mourning, but also to um, sort of find ways in which we can protect the interest um, that um, maybe Americans have had uh, in the past and have, 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 so, have defended so strongly around the world. Um, but I think what will be at stake in this is the credibility of America in that. And the credibility of America is challenged with the conflict in Israel-Palestine. It's not only challenged there, it's also challenged in Russia and Ukraine. Um, but it will be important that America shows some serious leadership with regards to both conflicts. And I think what we can tell from the candidates that we have both seen is that um, both of them are maybe not terribly great at it, but... We have certainly seen that some have made it a lot worse than others. And in the teaching that I do, 
um, there are several readings in there about how the previous Trump presidency has really impacted the Middle East very negatively by talking about Palestinians, but not with Palestinians and um, sort of making this a matter of a financial deal that one could pull off rather than actually trying to heal some of the rifts in the region. Now, again, that doesn't answer all the questions, but again, from a perspective of international relations, how can we look at some of these um, issues and take seriously, of course, the suffering um, of those who are involved. That's not something one can ever forget. Um, but at the same time, we should be careful not to be manipulated um, by them to the point where we become so divided as we are today. Okay. All may right. I, Thank you very may much. I know we are over time. May I add one statement here? Yes, sir. The situation, the genocide in Gaza and the 75 years of occupation of Palestine is absolutely run determined by the United States. The U.S. is complicit. Since October 7, $50 billion went to Israel from our tax dollars. The 2,000-pound bombs that destroyed buildings, killed families, killed over 300,000 people in Gaza is not caused by Russia or Iran. It is the United States complicity and the United States is morally on the wrong side of history. So we cannot blame Russia and Iran. Occupation and aggression of the Russians is terrible in Ukraine, wrong, immoral. Aggression, genocide, occupation, colonialism of Palestine by Israel is immoral, wrong, and must be stopped. This is simple. What you said, my friend, is not really the whole story. I okay. appreciate it. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have, thank you, Berhan. Thank you, Marietta. I understand both perspectives. This is the reason why I really wanted to make sure that we actually opened up this dialogue a little bit on this issue because many don't want to have it. And um, as one and I think Marietta knows this. I've traveled to Ukraine three times during wartime. I'm an advocate for Ukraine. I lead the North Carolina delegation with the American Coalition of Ukraine, and I'm obviously not Ukrainian. Uh, so one can be of a different ethnicity or race and have compassion and, and, and sensitivity and knowledge and understanding of what's happening with others and seek to have a global perspective. So Marietta, I appreciate what you're saying. Berhan, I absolutely understand and appreciate and value what you're saying, having served on the board with Voices for Justice in Palestine with you. Um, these are deep, um, these are drivers that can determine how people vote, if they vote, and whether or not they have faith in democracy. Um, and you are helping us to understand how to have this conversation in a responsible way and also think about the ramifications for what happens if someone like a Donald Trump forestalls even the, uh, the privilege of having the right to protest am, and express uh, our concerns. I'm a strong Democrat. I'm fighting for my with my community for Harris. Yeah. So that's why I wanted Harris to take a closer look at us and talk to us and think about our concerns. Thank that's you. why I wanted Harris to win. We do not want Trump. We will vote as if this is the last vote for us. Very we good. Will. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All Thank right. Uh, we have time for maybe uh, two more questions. If we can respond to them succinctly, two or three, perhaps. Um, can someone address um, the hypocrisy of being anti-abortion, but not about policies that sustain a child Health care, housing, education, et cetera. Reverend, I was gonna, I was, I was looking right at you. <laughs> so, Reverend Lindsay, uh, you got it. Yes. Um, it's a conversation that we always have. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's not about being pro-life, it's about pro-birth. And why I say that, because once the child is here, all of the support that um, the child needs is not there. Um, you don't want to um, make sure that the baby and the mother 
has access to um, exceptional premium, premium health care. You don't want to uh, make sure that um, they have livable wages, which would allow them to be able to house themselves and not have to live in their cars and work at the same time. You're not concerned if um, education is available. When you look at Project 2025, um, there is um, a mandate to dismantle public education, which by far those who are not able to afford um, private education, even with a voucher, where will they uh, be able to become educated in order to uh, be able to sustain themselves? Uh, when you look at Project 2025, it really supports being impoverished. It really supports uh, minimal wage. It really supports uh, no uh, no access to premium health care for Black women, uh, Black mothers, um, for Black families in particular. So when you, your question is very valid. And so um, it brings us back to why it's important for us to uh, cast our vote to uh, make sure that we are able to lift up all of the issues that deem important that really speak very loudly and clearly that we're not about sustainable life uh, in any uh, form. So when we um, when we ask that question, you know, take it to what's pro-choice if I can't choose? What's pro-life if I can't if I'm not going to have a healthy, meaningful mm -hmm. life? Um, both stand to have a closer look because when the programs are not there to make sure that families can thrive and be healthy, um, have the income that is needed, have the housing, the shelter that is needed, then um, we're not doing the job. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. All right, next question. And this will have to probably be the final one for tonight. Um, ah, I'm gonna read a passage from the Old Testament. Um, this is um, God, um, or Moses speaking to the people of Israel. I have set before you this day, life and death, or rather Joshua, I believe it is, Joshua. I've set before you this day, life and death, choose life. The government does not choose for you. So this has to do with individuals making responsible choices in this election. In this election, um, what guidelines do each of you use, and you've alluded to it, in making your electoral decisions, who you will vote for at the national, state, and local level? What are the principles, the guidelines that each of you uses? And I know you can uh, wax eloquent on this question for you know, for a while, but we but but we only have a few minutes. So, if you could give us the short version in thirty seconds or less, what guidelines do you use in making a decision uh, of for voting who you vote for uh, in this election? Let's start with uh, Dr. Brandon Toll. You're in Europe, I get it, but you're still voting there. So, how do you vote? What principles? Uh, parameters um, um, guide your decisions when you have to cast a ballot. And then we'll circle back to Reverend Butler last. Thank you, um, Paul. I'm not sure that the connection is, is very strong. Um, I think that's, that 30 seconds is not nearly enough to say um, really yeah. uh, in full depth how that process might take place. But I think what I find important is um, to remember my grandmother and to remember that decisions matter. Um, I sometimes try to think what it was like to live in the war and to have to make a decision when actually your life was at stake, you know, in the last days of the war, many of her friends were executed and this is all listed in a diary. Um, she was a woman of great faith. She was a woman of great conviction. And um, I admire that. And I wish that if I were ever before a choice like that, um, I would choose wisely as she did. Um, 
But at the end of the day, I can only make the decisions in the more mundane uh, life that I live. Um, and I try to honor uh, the wisdom that she told me. Yeah, very good. Very good. Dr. Galloway. I vote for the person that I know will make my children's life better, my grandchildren's life better, that will assure a better life for my children, my grandchildren, and my progeny. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ganahim. Yeah, I, I, I will vote for American values, American values that brought me to this America 45 years ago. I came because of the freedom, the opportunity, of, 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 of the equality, and that's really why. The day I became a citizen in 1983, I immediately went to the office and, and registered to vote. Mm -hmm. And I've been a Democrat since that time, and I will continue doing that. I will continue to fight for our values, the freedom, and at the same time, I will continue to fight to make America avoid the mistakes that America made against blacks, against Native Americans, and not repeat it in Palestine. This is exactly what I am for. This is exactly what I am fighting for. And my vote will be always driven by those beliefs. Thank you. Thank you. Reverend Glincy, Redrick. I promise you won't have to mute me. <laughs> I am driven by justice, equity, and fairness. That's how I will choose my vote. Our main guest speaker, Reverend Butler. Who is the most likely to fight for human dignity and the flourishing of the planet? Uh, who will fight for all of us? I um, I cannot tell you how helpful I believe this conversation is for many who are listening tonight um, because many are very angry. Uh, we're living in a very angry society. And when we are angry, we don't always do our best rationalization. And so it's helpful to listen to other voices. And it doesn't matter how young or old we are, whether we are scholar or a non-scholar, what matters is that we listen. And so I would have to say, I would vote for the person who was genuinely interested in hearing the voices, especially the voices of the hurting and the marginalized. I cannot vote for someone who I feel is tone deaf to the pain of others. But if someone has a heart to care and a mind to hear and a willingness to respond, that person I'm willing to put faith in. And so that is the reason why we're having this conversation tonight in the interest of the Harris Waltz campaign. We're not endorsing, but we're trying to lay out an argument in favor of democracy, freedom and justice, and our panelists, have helped me and hopefully they have helped our audience do that. If you wanna hear more of this conversation, by the way, um, not the same conversation, slightly different. Uh, Dr. Vandertoll, you will be with us uh, in the United States for several weeks. And I think you've got some open dates of availability. Uh, I know you'll be with us in Charlotte on November 9th at the Asian Library. Thank you, Dr. Galloway, for helping us to secure that venue. And I am excited to hear uh, what you will teach uh, on that particular occasion based on snippets of what you've shared. Dr. Butler and I are working together to secure other venues for you, perhaps in Atlanta at the Carter Center or in Washington, DC. This is a conversation we will continue to have offline. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation tonight. It's been immeasurably edifying uh, for me. Um, any last words, any last thoughts? One minute before we wrap up. Uh, 
Could I maybe um, just pass on uh, my thoughts as North Carolina is recovering from this hurricane that struck uh, earlier today? I've seen the pictures. Uh, it's from a long distance. Central Eastern Europe has had also a very hard couple of weeks with uh, lots of flooding. Um, when damage is done, it's so hard to rebuild. And my thoughts are um, with those who are um, affected by this hurricane. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Um, uh, we have one of the members of the Interfaith Caucus who is, um, I saw she and her husband are helping people escape houses and using boats and all of that. And so it is a, it is an immeasurable uh, pain point uh, for North Carolina. Thank you for reminding us to think about um, those in Western North Carolina. All right. Uh, I've been asked to end this conversation, but before I do, uh, I have been asked to make sure that the next time we have a conversation like this to center it around uh, the, uh, the Sudan and the Congo. So that will be a forthcoming conversation and we'll uh, bring on some of the same speakers and others who, who have expertise in that part of the world. But until then, faith and engagement, our faith engagement, engaging faith with Reverend Butler. I hope you've got a lot to take back to the Harris campaign. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to do it, <laughs> but that will be up to you. Uh, we've had the conversation. We've done our part. We will see you all in the future. Until then, have a wonderful evening and good night. Thank you all. It was amazing. I appreciate every one of you. It was great. You should do it again. And please share the recording with me, Paul, when you can. Absolutely. We yes. will do that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure uh, meeting each and every one of you and being in this panel. Nice meeting you. you, and I hope to continue being in touch with every one of you. Yes. I will find your emails and write you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Really beautiful conversation. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Thank you.